electrodes and in some sense communicate with these networks while they're embedded in their environment, while they're entangled with you know, tree roots and other microbes. Um, it would give us a totally different kind of access to the underground world. So are fungi using electrical signals to send information through their networks at high speeds? That could explain how they're able to coordinate their movements and solve problems, despite having no central control region or brain. But using these networks as biological sensors, or even computers? This stuff is starting to make my head hurt. You're listening to Crowd Science from the BBC World Service, where we're exploring the brain-bending biology of fungi. And speaking of which, fungi do, of course, have the power to alter our minds in a much more literal sense. The hallucinogenic properties of certain mushrooms have been used by cultures around the world for centuries, if not millennia. More recently, though, fungal psychedelics like psilocybin, which is the active compound in magic mushrooms, or LSD, which is derived from the ergot fungus, have attracted lots of attention from scientists who want to explore their potential for treating conditions like depression or anxiety. Crowd Science looked at this back in 2019 after being contacted by two listeners whose depression wasn't responding to conventional treatments. Our reporter, Dashi Navanayagam, spoke to James Rucker, a psychiatrist at King's College in London, who's conducting trials on whether psilocybin could help. There were two psychedelics that were discovered serendipitously by the same guy, Albert Hoffman, and isolated and then marketed as medicines. One was LSD and the other was psilocybin, what we're investigating now. And they were used when patients were stuck and the standard treatments, which usually back then were talking therapies, weren't getting anywhere. And it was used as a way to sort of loosen people's ideas um, around their um, depression or their addictions or their anxiety or their obsession. Of course, they're not a panacea, it doesn't work for everyone, but that paradigm of perspective shifting, of changing one's view of um, something that's troubling you from a mental health perspective, I think is quite powerful. So you've been involved with the trial of psilocybin and how it's been used for depression. What's happening when psilocybin has been administered to people who are depressed? We know what the drug is pharmacologically doing in the brain, and we know that the neurons that psilocybin affects are in the bit of our brain that is responsible for higher cortical functions. So the way we think and the way we integrate complex emotional, social and um, personal information in the form of memory to come to a sort of model of, model of the world and a model of ourselves. So what we think is that by stimulating these receptors and changing, just modifying slightly the way they're firing, within this part of the brain that mediates this effect, that we're allowing, it's like a sort of relaxation of the beliefs and expectations we have about feelings, ourselves, our relationships, others, the world. And that's what introduces the therapeutic window of opportunity. And psychedelics and good therapy are about enabling people to be flexible in their perspectives. Now, Merlin, you've actually taken part in a psychedelic study that involved LSD. What was that all about? Uh, these researchers wanted to know whether or not uh, doses of LSD could increase the problem-solving behaviour of scientists and mathematicians. So they'd recruited um, a load of, of researchers with posters in, in university departments. And so I saw one of these posters and it said, do you have a meaningful problem that needs solving? Uh, and so I... I thought, oh, yeah, I guess I do. And I called this number. And it turned out that it was an LSD study. And, and so after a, a long period of you know, questionnaires and um, assessments, then you, know, you went into the hospital and then you had a room um, where we were given LSD and then asked after some period of time to, to start thinking about what they called our work-related problem, something we were having trouble with, a question that we just couldn't crack. And I had a rather um, amazing time I found that the LSD indeed did allow me to explore this familiar problem from a new angle. And there was no new information that it provided, of course. This is a, you know, you're lying in a, in a hospital bed, you're not um, doing new experiments. But, but it did help me to, to imagine the interactions that I've been trying to imagine in a broader way, to approach from new directions these interactions and to, yeah, and to put them into a bigger context. What was it like? I mean, I'm kind of imagining that they 
you know, did they put mood lighting up and did they try and relax you to make it seem a little bit more like a party? Um, and, you know, because it's a scientific study that's asking quite important, serious questions. And yet they know they're giving you LSD. So it must have been a slightly um, unusual experience, shall we say? Yeah, it was very surreal. Uh, to be in a hospital room, which they've done their best to disguise, you know, to, to create a, a more relaxing atmosphere uh, for the participants in the study. So they'd hung uh, wall hangings on the wall and they had mood lights and they had music. Uh, and oh, so they actually did have all that stuff? <laughs> uh, yeah, they actually did, yeah. But wow. not to make it seem like a party, more to make us feel at ease. Um, sure. So I'm very glad they did so. But it was also very funny to, to be part of this in this thinly disguised hospital ward. Yeah, and I guess, you know, you're thinking about problems in your research into fungi using compounds that have been derived from fungi. It's kind of, there's sort of wheels within wheels there. Exactly. Fungal solutions to my fungal problems. The power of these compounds to induce such powerful experiences in us does beg the question, why did fungi evolve them in the first place? Well, it wasn't for our benefit because the earliest psilocybin producing fungi date back to 75 million years ago, long before humans burst onto the scene. But fungi have been manipulating the minds of other animals for much longer than ours, and for much more nefarious purposes. This is a clip from the BBC's television series Planet Earth, where host David Attenborough describes the astonishing behaviour of a fungus called cordyceps, sometimes known as the zombie fungus. And for good reason, it will send chills up your spine. These bullet ants are showing some worrying symptoms. Spores from a parasitic fungus called cordyceps have infiltrated their bodies and their minds. Its infected brain directs this ant upwards. Then, utterly disorientated, it grips a stem with its mandibles. This is the reason why. Like something out of science fiction, the fruiting body of the cordyceps erupts from the ant's head. These fungi grow into the bodies of these ants and uh, they override the ant's instincts, which is to stay low to the forest floor. And they create a fascination in the ant with height, and they, they cause the ant to climb up the stalk of the plant. And then adjust at the right height for the fungus to fruit, the right temperature conditions and moisture conditions for the fungus to fruit. They cause the ant to bite onto the vein of a leaf uh, in what's called the death grip. And... At that point, they kill the ant, sprout a, a stalk out of its head, from which they rain down spores on ants passing below. And um, what's amazing about this is that these behaviours are, are fungal behaviours rather than ant behaviours. One of the big researchers in this field describes an infected ant as a, as a fungus in ants' clothing. And it's really uh, astonishing. This has been going on for quite a long time. The, the death grips that ants leave on the underside of leaves these fossilise, and fossilised scars um, show that this has been going on for at least 48 million years. I mean, it's just kind of simultaneously horrific and, and exquisite, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And this ability to manipulate insect behaviour has evolved multiple times. And there are all sorts of different ways that fungi have, uh, have worked out how to accomplish similar things. There's one that infects cicadas that causes it to, the cicadas' back side of its body to disintegrate and for it to fly in a certain erratic way, which, you know, dropping fungal spores out of its ruptured back ends. Well, so it's just flying around with its the back half of it kind of crumbling, like leaving the boot open in the car. Exactly like that, yeah, dropping spores out. You know, the fungus doesn't have a twitchy muscular body like these animals do, so rather than evolve one, it just commandeers one. How on earth does the fungus do this? The most recent studies on this question have, have infected ants in the lab, and then slice them into pieces to, to make a map of how the fungus is growing within the body of the ant. And these studies are rather astonishing. Um, as much as 40% of the weight of an infected ant can be fungus. The fungus seems to grow around um, the body of the ant, but doesn't grow into its brain. And this suggests that the uh, fungus is acting on the brain of the insects using chemicals that will control the behaviour of the ant without necessarily being in its brain. It's also possible that the fungus can cut off 
the ant's brain from its body, to interpose itself between the brain and the body of the ant uh, and control the ant's muscle movements directly. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm starting to look at fungi with a whole new sense of wonder and admiration. Although, if I'm being honest, the image of a fungus in ants' clothing has popped up in more than one of my waking nightmares. Which does make me think we started this episode with a sense of optimism about the new year, and I'm not quite sure how we managed to get to zombie ants and cicadas happily flying around with their back halves missing. But it does highlight just how interconnected and entangled fungi are with the rest of life on Earth, from literally invading the nervous systems of insects, to allowing plants to move onto land, to producing chemicals that induce profound spiritual and even healing experiences in us. And that's something we're only just starting to appreciate fully. Here's Merlin with the final word. Our ignorance about these organisms tells us maybe quite a lot about the fact that we might still have many blind spots about the organisms that live on this planet, and that our knowledge and our understanding of the living world is um, still incomplete, uh, and that that should maybe inject us with some uh, humility. Thanks again to Merlin Sheldrake, author of Entangled Life, How Fungi Make Our Worlds, Change Our Minds and Shape Our Futures. Next time on Crowd Science, more on the natural world and its impact on the health and well-being of people living in cities. This episode was presented by me, Anand Jagatia, and produced by Rami Sabah. Thanks for listening. Bye. This is the BBC World Service, looking at climate change. The climate study endorsed by 11,000 scientists warns there'll be... How do we deal with the challenge of climate change? Each week, we'll talk to our journalists on the ground and hear how the crisis is unfolding before their eyes. And we'll be bringing together leading experts to hear how we might make a better future. Join Neil Rizal and Greer Jackson for The Climate Question, today at 20 GMT. And in 60 minutes, the newsroom with Oliver Conway. Will the WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange go free after a British judge rejects a US extradition request? The world gets the first doses of a new, cheaper and easier to store vaccine. And reaction from Georgia as President Trump is caught asking officials to overturn the election result. This is the BBC World Service, the world's radio station. Coming up on Outlook in a few minutes' time, filmmaker Kirsten Johnson and her dad have always had a shared interest in black comedy. He introduced me to Monty Python. He loved the cartoons in Punch magazine. He liked the cartoons in The New Yorker. He liked Charles Adams' cartoons. So years later, Kirsten suggested they make a film together, a movie where she stages his death over and over again in a series of fantastical accidents. And he laughed. His first response was to laugh. He wants to have fun. He's game. But there was a lot more going on than meets the eye. Because Kirsten's dad was actually struggling with dementia and she wanted to capture his spirit on screen. But it became a race against time. So I had that feeling of, I've started everything too late, and this won't be a funny film, and no one will want to watch this film. The story of a daughter's cinematic tribute to her dad. First, the latest headlines from the BBC Newsroom. Hello, this is Danielle Jawowiecka with the BBC News. A court in London has ruled that the WikiLeaks founder, Julian Assange, cannot be extradited to the United States to face charges relating to the disclosure of hundreds of thousands of secret military and diplomatic documents. Mr Assange's supporters say they revealed evidence of war crimes. Our diplomatic correspondent, James Landale, says Mr Assange's mental health was crucial in the decision. His defence team had argued consistently throughout the hearing last year that he was a suicide risk and that if he did not have the protection provided to him within Belmarsh High Security Prison, which is where he's been for the last 21 months, and if he was <clears throat> extradited to a US facility, there would be a risk that he would commit suicide, frankly. And on that point, the judge said that she found that the extradition demand was oppressive because of Mr. Assange's mental health. She was not convinced that the procedures outlined by the US authorities would prevent Mr. Assange finding a way of committing suicide. Britain has become the first country in the world to start giving people the Oxford AstraZeneca coronavirus vaccine in what the government hopes will be a pivotal moment in the fight against the pandemic. 
Chris Smith, a consultant virologist and broadcaster, says the new vaccine should protect recipients from a more infectious variant, which is behind a surge in cases. We don't think that these changes are sufficient to place this new variant of the virus beyond the realms of the protection conferred by vaccination, but that needs to be formally proved and experiments are ongoing at the moment. What I know about how the immune system works and what we know about how this virus works, we don't think there's a big risk at the moment that the new variant won't be prevented by the vaccine. Stocks have risen in London on the first day of trading since Britain left the European Union's single market and customs union. The FTSE 100 index rose by over 3% in early trading. Our economics correspondent Andrew Walker says the introduction of the new AstraZeneca vaccine is one reason for the market's optimism. That's seen by investors as an important moment in the route back to something more like normal commercial activity. In addition, there have been no reports of major disruption at the border with the EU in the early stages of a newly agreed trade arrangement. There is, however, considerable uncertainty around both factors. Some reports suggest traffic levels are unusually low and in the immediate future, tougher restrictions are widely expected in Britain to deal with rising infections. Leading US Democrats have attacked President Trump after a taped conversation showed him trying to persuade a top official in Georgia to overturn his election defeat in the state. The vice president-elect Kamala Harris accused Mr Trump of a bold-faced abuse of power. The House Intelligence Committee chairman Adam Schiff said it showed Mr Trump's contempt for democracy. World News from the BBC. An Iranian government spokesman has said that Iran has resumed 20% uranium enrichment at its Fordo nuclear facility in its latest breach of the 2015 nuclear deal. The spokesman said the enrichment had just restarted at the underground nuclear complex. Since 2019, Iran has broken several of the conditions of the agreement in response to President Trump's withdrawal from it. A court in Algeria has sentenced a man who posted satirical cartoons mocking the authorities on Facebook to three years in prison. Our Arab Affairs analyst Sebastian Asher reports. Walid Kashida has been found guilty of causing offence to the Algerian president Abdelmajid Taboun, as well as to Islam and insulting state institutions. The 25-year-old has been in detention for eight months. He was arrested after posting a cartoon making fun of President Taboon. It appeared on the Facebook page he started. It's called Hirak Memes, named after the anti-government movement that organised mass protests throughout 2019, which helped force the previous long-time president, Abdulaziz Bouteflika, to resign. Islamist insurgents in northern Mozambique are reported to have attacked a village inside a major gas project run by the French energy giant Total. The security forces are said to have beaten back the militants after a battle lasting several hours. The village of Kitunda is less than one kilometre from the company's airstrip. The Sri Lankan government has ordered tight foreign exchange controls after announcing a 3.9% contraction in the economy in the aftermath of the pandemic. The governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka said coronavirus had caused a record fall in the tourism and trade-dependent economy last year. The government wants to keep stricter controls on imports to save foreign exchange. A ban on non-essential imports, including vehicles imposed in March, has been extended through 2021. BBC News. Hello, I'm Emily Webb.
confirmed that he was not quite the Dick Johnson he had always been, but that he was still he still here, and it wasn't too late yet, but that I better get on it. <laughs> when Kirsten says he was being transformed, what she means is that her dad had begun to struggle with dementia, and she was worried she was losing him. Tell me about that, Dick Johnson. I mean, who was the dad that you grew up with? Uh, well, I mean... He is an extraordinary person, and I think I've spent my whole life wondering, like, how did he get to be so lovely? Um, Because, you know, he's one of these people, and I don't think there are that many, who will ask you a question, genuinely listen with curiosity to the answer, and then sort of reassure you and ask you another question. So he's never met me with judgment. He's never met me with an agenda. He's never tried to make me do something that he wanted me to do. He's just been curious about, wow, who are you at this moment in time? And one of the thrills of having children and having my father still alive when they were born was I saw him treat them like this when they were babies. It's just like, oh, You know, he'll say things like, ah, you know, that's not a problem. Just affirm them. Just affirm them. Mm -hmm. Just see them. That's it. And that's what I felt throughout my life with him. You might not be surprised to hear that Dick had a long career as a psychiatrist and spent his life listening to people. He also cared for Kirsten's mum when she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. So when he too began to show those familiar signs of memory loss, it was really tough. So I was in New York, and my father was living by himself and going to work, um, driving himself to work. And at that point in time, I was sort of talking to my dad probably every day on the phone and aware that he seemed to be um, wanting to have a lot of contact. And he said, oh, you know, funny thing happened on the way home last night, and there was some exit that wasn't marked the right way. And I was like, oh, that's too bad. Then he mentioned it again, and I asked him more about it, and I knew where he said the place was, and then I had a friend drive by there and discover that, yeah, there was a construction site, and my dad had driven through it and then driven home these many miles with four flat tires, which is just like a lapse of judgment that had nothing to do with who my father Mm. was. And when you got that confirmation from your friend, what was going through your head? Ugh, well, it was just sick-making because... A similar thing had happened with my mom in the beginning of her dementia. One of my friends had called me and said, oh, you know, your mom took us for a drive today with the kids, and she went through several stop signs. And, you know, then I called my dad's secretary, and she confirmed that she was starting to experience odd things that were, you know, unusual for my dad, that he was double booking his patients, that a few times the pharmacy had called to say that the prescriptions weren't quite right, and... You know, honestly, I think all of us so didn't want it to be true that it was really hard to hear about it. Kirsten knew that the clock was now ticking. She'd always regretted that she didn't have any footage of her mum before she was ill and she didn't want to make the same mistake again. So she went to her dad with a movie proposal. What did you say to him? I mean, how did you pitch it to him? I mean, I literally said, Dad, I have this idea that it would be really fun to do a movie where we worked with stunt people and we kill you over and over again and bring you back to life until you really die for real. Like, that's literally what I said to him. And he was like, <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> and, he, and he laughed. His first response was to laugh. Because, I mean, cause to many people from the outside, it, it would sound very outlandish. You know, I mean, <laughs> he's an outlandish guy. He wants to have fun. He's game. As a person, he's game. And, you know, he introduced me to Monty Python. He loved the cartoons in Punch magazine. He liked the cartoons in The New Yorker. He liked Charles Adams cartoons. OK, some context here, because Dick's taste for the absurd and black comedy made him a bit of a rule breaker. Kirsten's parents were both Seventh-day Adventists. It's a Christian denomination which has historically been strict when it comes to listening to popular music, watching movies or even reading fiction. But Dick would read novels, he loved jazz, and when the coast was clear, he'd sneak Kirsten into the cinema. 
he found these ways that were, quote, educational to be slightly subversive. So he took me to a series of Australian films, you know, that was sort of, sort of in this academic context. But in fact, we were watching Chant of Jimmy Blacksmith and The Last Wave. And my mother came along one time and it turned out that was the day that they were showing Mad Max. And she was so horrified <laughs> and like got me out of that, <laughs> you know, lecture room so fast. But uh, the first movie that my dad took me to see in the theater was Young Frankenstein. It's coming from the deep, dark recesses of the mind of Mel Brooks. I love him. Young Frankenstein. To explain it, it's this, um, this Mel Brooks comedy, and it's about Frankenstein. What do you remember about that? Oh, you know, like, the irreverence of it, the absurdity of it. I just remember the feeling of, you can do this? You can do what? What were you wondering? You can make fun of things you're not supposed to make fun of. You could be sacrilegious. You know, I was in a world where people were so observant. So the world of you can do was a mystery to me. And do you think your dad encouraged that in you? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think what my dad encouraged was seeing the complexity of what it is to be human. It was agreed that not only would father and daughter start on the film, but because of concerns about his health, Dick would pack up the family home and move to New York to live with Kirsten and her kids. She went to help him move and took along her camera. The first time you staged his death was at his home in Seattle. What what was that like, shooting that first death? Yeah, I mean, so I was home visiting my dad at the home that I grew up in. And so, you know, I was thinking like, huh, how could dad die at home? And one of the realizations came when we were filming of sort of watching him walk up and down the stairs. I was like, oh, right, mom fell down the stairs. And I had sort of forgotten that that had happened. And it was like, oh, right, you could fall down the stairs. Whoa. Can you just like put one arm up against the wall, like your arm is closer to the wall in some weird... Yeah, that's nice. Okay. But when I asked my dad to sort of lay down at the bottom of the stairs, it was, I, I felt like humiliated and ashamed on behalf of my own filmmaking capacities. I felt it was just like bad film school. You know, like I can't believe I'm making an 80 year old crawl around on the ground and this looks ridiculous. That was my thinking. How did he find it? He wants to prove his capacities. So he was like, let me try it. And he's like, and, I, and I'm like, ah, that doesn't look so good. And he's like, all right, well, then let me turn around. Can I put my leg up here? You know, where do you want me to put my arm? So he was all in. The scene ends with Dick lying at the bottom of the stairs. But then one of the most magical and glitter-filled moments of the film, his arrival in heaven. <laughs> When you see him arrive in heaven and there's, there's a chocolate fountain and there's popcorn and your dad's sitting at a table with all these people wearing these masks that you've printed out and you've got your mum there, you've got, I think, Frida Kahlo there and there's also Farrah Fawcett, the 70s TV star. Was that based on a conversation? Frederick, Frederick Douglass, Freud, <laughs> Bruce Lee, Buster Keaton. So it was a party. Billy Holiday. <laughs> <laughs> were, those based, were those people, were those names, were they based on a conversation you'd had with your dad about what his vision of heaven was? Yes. I mean, he, he, his picks were Freud and uh, Billy Holiday and Farrah Fawcett. <laughs> <laughs> I love that Farrah Fawcett made the cut. That made me quite happy. <laughs> yeah, you know, and it's like, it's like, it's just pure pleasure mm. on a certain level. Farrah Fawcett like, it represents the pleasure of youth, the pleasure of sexuality, the pleasure of that fabulous hairstyle, you know, eternal youth. And there are also these sort of Fred Astaire-esque sequences of your dad and your mum, and, and they're kind of people wearing face masks and they're dancers, and they've got your dad's face and your mum's face doing these incredible dances as well. I mean, it's a really sort of magical vision of, of what heaven could be for him, I suppose. Hold me close. Hold me, babe Let's make the most of the time that the girls say Yeah, yeah, I mean... The, the dance sequence was not his fantasy. That was my fantasy. It was a fantasy around, you know, the sort of moment of possibility and love between my parents that was their young, exhilarated love. 
I didn't get to see the two of them falling in love. It was my experience to see them in love with each other over time. And between these these dream sequences and these fake death scenes, there's this footage you shot of your dad and how he's progressing. And one scene that is is really emotional is when he finds out that he won't be able to drive again. You never said you were taking the car away from me. It was said that we were selling the car because you're moving to New York. Yeah, I always said that. Right, that's all. But who's selling and when and where? It's put it being put on Craigslist this week. I'm telling you what I know. But you're not getting the car back. I do know that. Never driving it again. No. Not that car. Maybe some other car. Is that the worst news ever? Not the worst, but it's pretty bad news. Yeah. You know, I'm not far enough gone that I couldn't drive my own car. You know? Well, it's not about that. It's about the fact that you're moving to New York. Yeah, I know. You can't I'm keep the car. My car. I That's know right. That. That's all. But in between now and... The it's time only a couple of days. Okay. Sorry. I know it hurts. It's your independence, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I know how mom must have felt when we put it in the nursing home. <laughs> Is that what it feels like? Not that bad. It's not that bad. It's not that bad. It's not that bad. Not that bad. Can you describe that interaction from your perspective? Oh, it was brutal. You know, I mean, just because I'd been through it with my mom, and my mom sort of never forgave us for taking her car keys away, but it it is literally agency and independence, the capacity to drive a car. It's it's symbolically that, but it's also literally that, and, and it's a matter of life and death. You know, I have this friend whose mother had dementia, Carol Dysinger, and Carol said to me, you're either going to do things too early or too late. And when it comes to taking away the car keys, it's like, do you want it to be too late after your parent has been in a car crash and killed someone? No, you don't. And I was sort of hoping to avoid that question by moving him to New York. You know, it's like, oh, we're going to New York. Like, we won't even mention the car. And then to see it land with him was, you know, heartbreaking to me and to him, clearly. Knowing that he would be likely to deteriorate over the course of making the film... Did you have any of those conversations with him about, you know, his boundaries? And and did he have any questions, any comments about how he wanted to be portrayed? Um, I mean, the way he wanted to die, he wanted to be shot by a jealous husband is what he said. (laughs) And we never did do that scenario. It turned out, you know, I mean, I think what was so interesting in this process is a question of trust, right? And he said... I trust you implicitly. I may not remember what I'm doing. We know that's what happens, but I trust you. And I revisited it over and over again, and he would say the same thing. And I really felt I had the responsibility to not break the line of trust with my father. And so that meant I wouldn't ask him to do anything for the movie that would hurt him. I wouldn't ask him to do anything to the movie that he thought was wrong to do. And yet, as anyone who knows dementia knows, as soon as dementia grabs hold, it starts to reveal contradictory responses in people. So that, you know, there might be one moment when Dad says, no, I don't really want to do this. And then, you know, you ask him two minutes later, and he's like, sure, let's do it. (laughs) And so how do you deal with that? And I think... This complexity around what permission really is, is is deeply a part of what I do and am exploring as a filmmaker. You know, I think, you know, the complexity of the ethical work of a camera person. Before Kirsten's dad leaves his home, his old life, and moves around two and a half thousand miles to New York, Kirsten stages a fake funeral in the same church where they said goodbye to her mother. You know, when my mom died, we really put on a funeral as she would have wished. And I remember sort of the shock of it ending and realizing, ah, she's not here to see it. And I really wanted to hug her at the end of it. And so 
you know, when I had the dream about my dad saying, I'm not dead yet, I had this idea of like, oh, we could do the funeral while he's still alive and to really do it. And so, you know, that meant reaching out to the pastor of the church and asking whether we could use this sacred space. And he loved my dad and knew my dad. And he's like, yeah, I think it would be an amazing celebration of him. And then I had to reach out to, you know, hundreds of people at the church and say to them, I want to do this. And by the time we did it, everyone was aware of my father's dementia. They were aware that they too were losing him. So people came completely ready to engage in the feelings of grief and loss. Dick loved church and the many parties at our home. He loved my tradition of ending a party on a happy note. Around 10 p.m., I would ring a bell, get everybody's attention, and with a loud voice announce, you have eaten all my food, you have drunk all my wine, you said everything worth hearing, now it's time to go home. <laughs> Before they left, I would play a tune on my hunting horn called Going Away. Boy, I gotta get through this. Jake uh, came over and said, Ray, if you all leave me, I want you to play going away. <laughs> I want you to play going away at my funeral. <laughs> that, that moment when you see your dad's friend Ray sort of off in a corner and he's really, I mean, he'd, he'd given this fake eulogy and then he's really in bits. Was that a moment? Did you question whether you had gone too far when you saw how much it affected him? You know, um, can I say something? I love um, talking to you and to, to, to people who speak in different languages than me. You have this term that you're saying, I was in bits. He was in bits, which isn't a thing that we say in American English. Um, we say someone's falling, fallen apart. Um, but I think both express this idea of like, we're trying to hold something together that might fall apart. Ray knew my father was alive. Ray knew we were doing this crazy movie, but Ray is also 91 years old and he knows dad has dementia and he is grieving him already. And Ray knows that he might die soon, you know? And his whole eulogy was about, you know, we've made a promise to each other, whichever one of us goes first, the other will give the eulogy. And so there was Ray feeling that my dad had gone first. And um, it was so fun to see the film with Ray at Sundance. He was there and he was like, I made this film. I'm the only one who went there emotionally. You and your dad are just reassuring each other, yourselves all the time and giggling. And like he's like, I went there. That's what it is, the gaping maw of death. And was it a relief that he did react like that ultimately? Because I could imagine that at the time it must have felt quite different when you saw him. Oh, you know, it's devastating. You know, and this is the challenging thing when you're a camera person. Somehow you tap into these moments. You allow the space for people to express their emotions, and sometimes their emotions are devastating. But in some ways, that shot, that image, is an acknowledgement of our respect and love for another person, that we can see their inner pain and we're not afraid of it. And I think that so embodies who my father is. He's not afraid of this pain that we're going through together. He has empathy for us, and he's trying to, let's make it funny if we can, and if we can't, let's just hug each other. And you mentioned that at the end of the service, you, you come out with your dad and, and he can see all of his friends and all the people who've been saying all these things about him. What, what was that experience like for him, do you think? Oh, so many things. I mean, I think at moments it was hilarious. Like as people were coming in, he's like, huh, the crowd's not very big. Much ado about nothing. Um, and then at another moment, um, my father's listening to the pastor speak and is just sobbing. And I film him and I say, it's really hard, Dad, isn't it? And I'm crying. And then my dad's like, yeah, I'm really going to miss that guy. He was a really great guy. And then he just totally punked me and started laughing hysterically, you know. <laughs> I mean, it really was a celebration. I think everybody in that 
church didn't realize how cathartic it would be to go there and then get to hug my dad after they had grieved his loss. Mm. So after he leaves his home in Seattle, he moves in with you in New York, and it's you and it's your two kids, and it's 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 not a it's not a huge apartment. How how was that? <laughs> it's a one bedroom apartment, she said, actually. Diplomatically. <laughs> <laughs> what what was it like having him there? You know, the way in which I am extremely lucky is the timing of all of this. So my children were young when he moved in with us. I have twins, and they were four years old. The other way in which I am lucky is that I co-parent my children with a couple, two men who are gay and who are married to each other, and they live next door to me. So from the children's birth forward, we have shared parenting. So I had some support in the parenting. And then the kids and my dad were sort of like, they all needed taking care of. So I was already taking care of my kids. So taking care of my dad felt possible. But, you know, as the dementia advanced, like toggling between the mind of a demented person and eight-year-olds and real life and filming became a lot to handle. We'll take a short break now, but do stay with us. In a couple of minutes, we'll hear how Kirsten's decision to stage her dad's funeral before he was dead went down with her brother. This is the BBC World Service, where our new series of presidential profiles starts with Donald Trump. In part one, Rob Watson tells the life story of the property billionaire who made it all the way to the White House. A fast-talking, controversial character with a turn of phrase just made for the age of social media. He had monumental ambition at a very early age. A deeply damaged man. Losing is never easy. Not for me, it's not. Who constantly needs to have his ego propped up. And in part two with me, Netta Taufik, I'll be looking at his political record in office. They underestimate him over and over and over again in the economic area and in the political area. Donald Trump has withdrawn us from just about everything and those who have been our allies in the past are not at all sure they're still allies. Presidential Profiles of Donald Trump. Tuesday at 9 and 20 GMT. Next on Outlook, Kirsten Johnson invites her brother to their father's fake funeral. My brother was queasy about it in the beginning. Um, and he saw the humor in it, but he was, he was skeptical. And he didn't think the church members would agree to do the funeral. And he didn't think anyone would come. And I think he didn't want to come. He, he was not ready. We hear more from the filmmaker who decided to stage her own dad's death. First, the latest news. BBC News with Danielle Yawovietska. A court in London has ruled that the WikiLeaks founder, Julian Assange, cannot be extradited to the United States to face charges relating to the disclosure of hundreds of thousands of secret military and diplomatic documents. The judge said there was a real risk he'd commit suicide. The US claims the leaks, the biggest in its history, broke the law and endangered lives. Britain has begun inoculating people with the Oxford AstraZeneca coronavirus vaccine in what the government hopes will be a turning point in the fight against the pandemic. The authorities plan to administer more than half a million doses at hundreds of vaccination centres. The UK is facing a surge in coronavirus cases linked to a more infectious variant of the virus. France is starting to vaccinate healthcare workers over 50 amid anger at the slow progress of its national coronavirus vaccination campaign. In the first days of the campaign, the number of those vaccinated had only reached several hundred. President Emmanuel Macron is reportedly furious. An Iranian government spokesman has said that Iran has resumed 20% uranium enrichment at its Fordo nuclear facility in its latest breach of the 2015 nuclear deal. The spokesman said that the enrichment had just restarted at the underground nuclear complex. Iranian media say that the Revolutionary Guards have seized a South Korean flagged vessel in the Gulf. The vessel had earlier been reported to have changed course without explanation from its route between Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. Leading US Democrats have attacked President Trump after a taped telephone conversation showed him trying to persuade a top official in the state of Georgia to overturn his election defeat there. The vice president-elect Kamala Harris accused Mr Trump of an abuse of power. The House Intelligence Committee chairman Adam Schiff said Mr Trump's contempt for democracy was laid bare. BBC News. 
Hello, this is Outlook with me, Emily Webb, continuing my conversation with the American filmmaker Kirsten Johnson. She recently made a film about her dad, Dick Johnson, but it's no ordinary movie. I mean, I literally said, Dad, I have this idea that it would be really fun to do a movie where we worked with stunt people and we kill you over and over again and bring you back to life until you really die for real. And he laughed. His first response was to laugh. There are multiple ways in which father and daughter enact his death. There's even a fake funeral that he attends alongside his friends and family. But the reason Kirsten picked up her camera and trained it on her dad is far more relatable. He was struggling with dementia and terrified at the thought of losing him. She wanted to capture the father she loved and even hoped it would somehow make him live forever. So alongside fantastical scenes of Dick in fatal car crashes and construction site accidents is documentary footage of him slowly losing his memory. I wanted to know how her brother reacted to the idea. Oh, you know, I think my brother was queasy about it in the beginning. And, you know, he's the one who I share our responsibility to our dad and our love of our dad. And um, and he saw the humor in it, but he was he was skeptical. And he didn't think the church members would agree to do the funeral. And he didn't think anyone would come. And I think he didn't want to come. He, he was not ready to face the idea of my dad's death or his dementia. And um, so when, you know, I said to him, we've got the green light from the pastor, we've got the green light from the church, the people are coming. He was like, oh, I guess I have to come. And it was like, it's your choice. But I can tell you, I was really scared showing the rough cut of the film to my brother. And I waited a long time to do it. And um, my brother wept through watching it. And He's really proud of what the film has become and really grateful to me because now that we know what we've already lost, um, the film is a treasure for him too. What did your dad make of the film when it was done? So my dad makes of the film, right? It's plural. You know, he's seen the film hundreds of times. He was always a collaborative partner in this process, and I consider him that even now. You know, he'll listen to this recording, and he'll listen to him and be so pleased. So my dad loves the film. He's very proud of the film, and he he laughs at the film, and he gets to see his old family and friends, and they come alive for him again. You're very honest in the film. You speak about the fear of losing your dad and, and, you know, that access to his advice and, and his warmth. What was it like saying those things, knowing that he would be watching that film? You know, I think it, I've learned this from filming people and having conversations with people. Often it is our own shame or our own reserves or our own fear that doesn't allow us to ask the questions of people or say things to them because we're afraid of the response and what it will do to us. So my father sort of taught me some things about being emotionally fearless because I think he is. With dementia, because it goes on and on and on and the person shifts in so many ways, you can do many things. Sometimes you're defended about it and you just simply say a simple no, Dad, I can't take you home right now from the dementia care facility because the pandemic's happening and it's going to be over soon and hopefully it'll be over soon. And you can sort of do that many times. But then once in a while you have to be open and say, this is killing me, Dad. I wish I could take you home and I wish you didn't have dementia, but you do. And I can't live my own life when you're waking up in the middle of the night all the time and I have to take care of you. And I have said things like that to my dad when I went to visit him recently It was really hard to say that because I wasn't allowed to hug him. And I was like, you can't say something like that to someone and not hug them. But then I went again with my brother and I was like, I think let's say some of these things to him. We need to say them. And it was so sweet, me and my brother, like explaining to my dad why each of us, the other one, couldn't keep living their lives and take care of him. And he totally heard us and he said, you know, I want you to enjoy your lives and live your full lives. You're doing the right thing by leaving me here. And then we're like, we don't want to leave you here. And he's like, I don't want to be left here. But, you know, that you can say all of those things. Don't just say it once. Say it twice. Say it in three different ways. That's what Mm -hmm. dementia allows. Has there been a particular moment where he's responded to you talking about your pain, to the pain of thinking about losing him. What has his response been to that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he'll say, he say, oh, it must be so hard for you to watch your dad falling apart.
And he'll, he'll, he'll um, say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I got this disease. Mm -hmm. And we all are. <laughs> you know, but I think that's the thing, right? Like, this is what we have to do. Like, when we love people, it's like, we don't know what's coming. We don't know what pandemic is coming. We don't know what accident is coming. We don't know when someone's going to get shot. We don't know when someone's going to trip and fall over and break their hip. You know, we don't know. But uh, we can't let that stop us from loving them and talking to them and being with them. And how is he now? I mean, you mentioned that he's he's gone into a care home. How is he doing now and how is his memory? So happily, he still is like thrilled to hear my voice. So he totally recognizes me. I think he's a little lost in time and space. So, you know, he sort of assumes that I dropped him off at this place a week ago, even though he's been there for months now. And I talked to him yesterday. And it's funny, like, I've just decided to, to do and be in the moment. So I was out on a bicycle ride by myself, and I was riding up this hill. It was really cold. And it just reminded me of, like, my dad urging me to keep riding up a hard hill when I was a little girl. And I was just like, nah, I'm going to stop the bike and call him. And I did, and I said, you know, Dad, I'm in the middle of a hill. I need your encouragement to get to the top. And he's like, oh, you could do it. <laughs> and um, I, because my mother is not here, I have this realization and understanding of, like, it's now. The moment is now. If I think of my dad, I call him. If he thinks of me, he calls me. And at some point, that will no longer be possible. So let's engage in this moment. You spoke at the beginning about your desire to make your dad survive through the film. Looking at it now, when you look at what you've done, is that something you think you've achieved? You know, I honestly, it was funny, Nels Bangerder, who's just this fabulous editor that I work with, in the beginning, when he was first starting to see footage, he was like, ah, I don't know if your dad can really be at the center of this movie. And I was like, well, he's the only dad I got, so this is what we have to work with. Um, so I think we both underestimated how my dad's presence would come through because, you know, my dad had lots of limitations in the making of this film in terms of his dementia. I had these really crazy, ambitious ideas that it kept becoming clear, no, we're too far behind the dementia. He won't be able to do that. He won't be able to do this. So I had that feeling of it's too late and this won't be a funny film and no one will want to watch this film. But more importantly, that I've missed the chance to sort of hold on to the essence of my father. But it was late in the process, like November of last year, we watched a rough cut and I just cried the whole way through it because I was like, oh, in, with all these little fragments, we've done it. The energy of my father is here. And what is true for me is that, you know, I cannot remember very much about what my mother was like before the Alzheimer's obliterated her. And I wish to remember my father, but I know that in the future I will not be able to. And so this film is some, it's an, it's, it's, it's something solid. It's like a hallucination of him that I can revisit in the future when I'm not able to remember who he was. And when you revisit it, what do you think is your favourite piece of footage you shot of your dad? Right now, my favourite piece is that moment where um, he just says to me, nah, you know, I'm enjoying life too much. I don't want to die. And he's like, I give you permission to, you know, euthanize me. And then he's like, but run it by me first. <laughs> like that moment, I just, he feels so young and so happy. And like, mm -hmm. he has no idea how much it's asking of us to take care of him. And he's just like, I love it. Like, this is great. Why wouldn't I want to stop doing this? And it's like, so many people say, I want to die in my sleep or in a painless way, or I don't want to be incapacitated. I don't want other people to have to take care of me. But there's a part of myself when I, like, it's been really hard taking care of my dad. And there's a part of me when I see that footage, I'm like, who cares that it's hard? Like, he still loves life. Hmm. Something that really struck me was your dad's capacity. In the conversations that he'd have when he'd be, say, moving out of his house and he'd be like, oh, I'm sad, but I'm, you know, I'm happy to be moving in with you, or, you know, all of those sorts of conversations. His ability to be warm and to smile, so it really stayed with me after watching the film. Mm, you're making me smile right now. I mean, I think that what Dad is doing throughout the film 
is trying to reassure both of us? Yeah, well, the, the problem is, if you don't leave it, I don't get close to you. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. That's it. So I'd trade this house any day for, for being with you. There's no, no question about that. <laughs> That's not even a consideration. Yeah. I feel the same way. And one of the things that he'll say to me when I call him, it's just, I just want to make sure that you know how much I love you. And that's it, right? But th that needs to be affirmed again and again. You know, my father's doing it like hundreds of times a day with his dementia to the point where it's like, yes, I know I'm the best daughter in the world. Awesome. Like, can we stop talking about it? But I think his smile is like, I'm delighted to be here. And I think it's, I'm delighted to be on this earth. I'm delighted to be on this earth with you. I'm delighted to be in this moment with you. And literally, I could call my dad right now, and he'd just be like, ah! Oh! You know, it's, it's like this little cry of joy. <laughs> Kirsten Johnson speaking to me from her home. The film she made about her dad is called Dick Johnson is Dead. This is Outlook from the BBC World Service. Now to a story of love. In the early days of lockdown, when parts of Italy first faced strict COVID-19 restrictions, it involves a couple, the city of Fair Verona, and there's a balcony involved. Their names are Paola Agnelli and Michele Dal Paus, lockdown's very own Romeo and Juliet. It all started on March the 17th. My sister Lisa is a professional violinist, and every day at 6 pm she goes out onto the balcony and plays music for the neighborhood. And I usually help her with the sound system. That day, Lisa was playing a song by Queen, We Are The Champions. And as I was listening to her, I turned around and saw this really handsome man on the opposite balcony. And I thought, hmm, he's cute. I'm currently working from home. So when I heard the violin playing, I walked out onto my balcony to see what was going on. I first noticed the violinist, and then I saw this beautiful woman standing next to her. And that was it. It was love at first sight. Luckily, my sister Silvia knows Paola. They go to the gym together. So I looked her up on social media and I sent her a message. As soon as the song was over, I found a message on my phone. I wanted to keep it a bit vague, you know, so I wrote, I just fell in love with the Agnelli sisters. Then I thought, I should be more direct. If this goes wrong, we're in lockdown anyway, so there's no risk of bumping into her in the street. So I said, I could write a book, Love in the Times of Coronavirus. And it worked. I charmed her with my words. That day, we wrote to each other till the early hours.
imparato veramente così tanto per la prima volta di una persona. At the beginning, I was just trying to make Paola laugh, but now I'm deeply in love with her. These are really weird times and I can't really do much to show my love, so I'm trying to express myself in this way. Non mi sembra nemmeno vero, dico la verità, perché è troppo bello per essere vero. Però ogni tanto Sometimes I have to pinch myself because it's just too good to be true. We both live with our elderly parents, so we're being very careful and we're respecting the lockdown measures. We've only come closer once. We spoke to each other through the garden fence, but we were still four meters apart. We just can't... first Christmas together. That's all we have time for today. I'm Emily Webb. Goodbye from me and the whole Outlook team. Hello and welcome to Witness History from the BBC World Service with me, Alex Last. And today, a musical tale from antiquity as we go back three and a half thousand years to tell the story of the world's oldest written song. Our story begins in the 1950s on the coast of Syria with the discovery of some clay tablets amid the ancient ruins of a palace once home to a long-lost civilization, the Hurrians, who lived in Syria three and a half thousand years ago. These tablets were discovered in the 50s and a bit before by a team of French archaeologists at the site of Rashamra in northwest Syria in the ancient palace of Ugarit, which had been destroyed by the ancient Egyptians around 1400 BC. Richard Dumbrell is an archaeomusicologist, a specialist in the ancient music of Syria and Iraq. There were about 29 tablets, but they could only reconstruct one of them completely from three bits. And what was special about this tablet, known as H6, was that it contained both the lyrics and the music for a song and dated to around 1400 BC. Never before had a complete song of such antiquity been found. Many years later, Richard went to Damascus to see the tablet for himself. It's about 20 centimetres wide and about 7 to 10 centimetres high. The right of the tablet was badly burnt, almost like glass. It is inscribed with, uh, in two parts. The first part at the top of the tablet is uh, lyrics and the bottom part is the music. The tablet was written in the Hurrian language, but the script they used was cuneiform, the world's earliest form of writing, which was also used by the Babylonians and the other great ancient civilizations in Iraq and Syria thousands of years ago. We could read what was written down, but it was extremely difficult to translate it. But it tells us that it was a composition written by a Hurrian composer, and it should be sung in the musical mode of Nitki Blim, and it is a Zalusi, a song. It is not written that it should be accompanied by any instruments, that is very important. And the song was addressed to the deity, the goddess of the moon. And though Hurrian is not well understood, attempts have been made to translate the lyrics. 
Once I have endeared the deity, she will love me in her heart. The offer I bring may wholly cover my sin. Bringing Cecily... It's this girl who he thinks she's infertile because she has sinned, and therefore goes and prays goddess Nigal, offering her some sesame. She, she begs the goddess to, to become pregnant. That's it. It became known as the Hurrian hymn or the Hurrian song. So the big question was, what did the song actually sound like? And that's where it gets trickier and more contentious, because their music was not written as we know it today, with individual notes on a stave. Instead, groups of notes were given a specific name. To give you an idea, the first line of the music had a sequence of words, kablite, irbute, kablite, saari, isate. Now luckily, the Hurrians were using Babylonian musical terms and archaeologists had already unearthed older Babylonian tablets which partially explained the words in this ancient musical theory. It turned out that each word referred to an interval between two notes on a scale, which were then to be sung or played. It, it was a very simple way. It is exactly the same method which is used today in the Middle East when you say, for instance, to a musician, Bayati, for instance, immediately the musician knows what the notes of it are, and he can start playing these notes. So the, the Hurrians had this system. So, for instance, Yerbute, Kablite, Titimi Charte, Zerte, and so forth. And when you said this to a musician, the, he knew exactly what it was about but it still wasn't clear how these intervals would actually have been played. One of the first to have a crack at interpreting the music was an American Assyriologist, Professor Ann Kilmer, at Berkeley in California, who'd pioneered work on translating ancient musical notation. She published her version of the Hurrian song in the 1970s, and it captured the world's attention. The words and music to what is now being called the world's oldest song were written on clay tablets found along the coast of Syria. Seems to be a love song uh, pertaining to the cult of the Hurrian pantheon uh, at this ancient coastal Mediterranean city of Ugarit, or Ugarit. Since this particular piece dates to somewhere around 1400 BC, it's therefore a very early example of ancient music, and the earliest we have. <laughs> The problem was some musicologists fundamentally disagreed with this interpretation. Not least Richard Dumbrell. There were academic arguments over what would have been the pitch of the notes, how they would have been played, and in what order. Do you play the notes of the interval consecutively as a melody, or at the same time as a harmony? And if it was harmony, well, that would be revolutionary, because that would mean the Hurrians and Babylonians were writing harmony more than 2,000 years before the first known examples of such sophisticated harmonic composition. Richard Dumbrell, for one, thinks that's simply not the case. Some scholars had decided to pose the idea that the intervals in Babylonian music were harmonic. But this does not work, because, for instance, with the Hurrian songs... A uh, human voice cannot sing two notes at the same time. The, the development of harmony, it's a complex organic process. You do not suddenly invent harmony. And if that were the case, we would also have other civilization playing in harmony, such as Egypt or Persia or what have you, but this is not the case. And also, had it been practiced in ancient Babylon, it would have survived to this day, and it would have been the Arabs who composed, who would have their Bach and Beethoven and Chopin and so forth, and, and not the West. And so Richard went to work, and after 20 years of study, he presented his interpretation, which is sung here by the Armenian Syrian soprano, Savan Habib. It was in 2011, I went to Damascus for a conference and I first presented my transcription of the tune to leading Arabian musicians coming from all parts of the world. And I was a bit scared with the eventual reaction. And to the contrary, I was actually astonished. They started to hum it 
and clapping their hands as if they had known this melody all their life. And in fact, this melody was very close to them. For them, this melody was part of their inheritance, and it was very reassuring. Still, there are many other interpretations out there, and the debate will go on. But irrespective of the arguments, the Hurrian song does provide a tantalizing glimpse of an ancient society three and a half thousand years ago, whose music still echoes today. The Hurrian song is the oldest song ever written, and it is certainly the earliest evidence of a melody written with a system still in use today with Arabian music, and that is quite important. It said there was a continuity, at least from 1400 BC up to today. Richard Dumbrell and the singer Savan Habib ending this edition of Witness History with me, Alex Last. For more of our history programmes, just search online for BBC Witness History. This is the BBC World Service. Now here's something to think about. I'm David Edmonds, and in The Big Idea, I'll be examining new research on human reason and rationality. Cultures that have been more integrated into market trading, they show a stronger concern for fairness. I found some of the most fascinating ideas around and the people who thought them up. The Big Idea, Sunday at 14 GMT. And in 30 minutes, the conversation with Kim Chakanetsa. A Korean-American journalist and a Danish writer tackle the question of how to be happy. You'll hear about the Korean concept of Minchi, which is the ability to read the room, and how that boosts happiness, and about why Denmark is constantly landing the top spot when it comes to happiness surveys. Stay with us. The Newsroom is next on the BBC World Service, the world's radio station. BBC World Service, it's 13 hours GMT. This is Oliver Conway with the newsroom. A court in London rules that the WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange cannot be extradited to the US to face espionage charges. His supporters are delighted, but will he now go free? Also on the newsroom, the world gets a new, cheaper and easier to store vaccine as Britain rolls out the AstraZeneca jab. The vaccine means everything to me. I mean, it's... To my mind, it's, it's the only way of getting back to a bit of normal life. You know, this virus is terrible, isn't it? In another challenge to the rest of the world, Iran increases its nuclear enrichment and seizes a South Korean tanker. And... So, so tell me, Brad, what are we going to do? We won the election and it's not fair to take it away from us like this. President Trump is accused of abusing his power by trying to get officials to overturn his election defeat. First, our top stories. Hello, this is Danielle Jawowiecka with the BBC News. A court in London has ruled that the WikiLeaks founder, Julian Assange, cannot be extradited to the United States to face charges relating to the disclosure of hundreds of thousands of secret military and diplomatic documents. The US says the leaks a decade ago broke the law and endangered lives. Mr Assange's supporters say they revealed evidence of war crimes. Helena Wilkinson reports. Julian Assange's fiance wept as the judge ruled that he wouldn't be extradited for trial in America. Lawyers for the 49-year-old had argued that Mr Assange wouldn't face a fair trial and the charges against him were politically motivated. Today, the judge said there was no evidence the US Department of Justice intended to punish him as harshly as possible. But after hearing evidence on Mr Assange's mental health, the judge said the US was incapable of preventing him from attempting to take his own life. Therefore, extradition, she said, would be oppressive. The US is planning to appeal against today's decision. Britain has become the first country to start giving people the Oxford AstraZeneca coronavirus vaccine in what the government hopes will be a pivotal moment in the fight against the pandemic. More than half a million doses will be administered at hundreds of vaccination centres in the coming days. 82-year-old Brian Pinker was the first to receive the jab at a hospital in Oxford. The vaccine means everything to me. I mean, it, to my mind, it's, it's the only way of getting back to a bit of normal life. You know, this virus is terrible, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's a no-brainer. 
France is starting to vaccinate healthcare workers over 50 amid anger at the slow progress of its national coronavirus vaccination campaign. In the first days of the campaign, the number of those vaccinated had only reached several hundred. President Emmanuel Macron is reportedly furious, criticising the pace in one newspaper as like a family stroll. Leading US Democrats have attacked President Trump after a taped telephone conversation showed him trying to persuade a top official in Georgia to overturn his election defeat there. The vice president-elect Kamala Harris accused Mr Trump of a bold-faced abuse of power. The Washington Post released extracts of a conversation in which Mr Trump called on Georgia's Secretary of State to find him enough votes to overturn the outcome. From Washington, here's Deborah Alfarone. We're now hearing from Senator Dick Durbin of Illinois. He's a Democrat, and he says that the president is unhinged and dangerous, but he's also saying that the, what he did calls for nothing less than a criminal investigation. And there are growing cries of this as well. So one former Justice Department inspector says it could actually violate federal law. You're listening to the World News from the BBC. An Iranian government spokesman has said that Iran has resumed 20% uranium enrichment at its Fordo nuclear facility in its latest breach of the 2015 nuclear deal. The spokesman said that the enrichment had just restarted at the underground nuclear complex. Our Middle East analyst Sebastian Usher reports. The move to upgrade uranium enrichment at one of Iran's key nuclear complexes is a significant escalation in Tehran's gradual dismantling of the conditions imposed by the nuclear deal. All of its breaches have been framed as a response to President Trump's withdrawal from the agreement and subsequent re-imposition of sanctions. In spite of this, the step is likely to further complicate the president-elect Joe Biden's efforts to return to diplomacy in U.S. relations with Iran. The seizure by Iran's revolutionary guards of a South Korean tanker in the Gulf would only add to anxiety in the region over what might happen in the final days of the Trump administration. An attack on a bus in Syria has killed at least nine people, including seven government soldiers. The ambush took place on the road between Raqqa and Damascus. It's the second such attack in less than a week. The Islamic State group said it carried out the earlier attack, but there's so far been no claim of responsibility for the latest ambush. Islamist insurgents in northern Mozambique are reported to have attacked a village inside the site of a major gas project run by the French energy giant Total. The security forces are said to have beaten back the militants after a battle lasting for several hours. A court in Algeria has sentenced a man who posted satirical cartoons mocking the authorities on Facebook to three years in prison. Walid Kachida has been in detention for the past eight months after he posted a cartoon criticising the Algerian president, Abdul Majid Taboon. BBC News. Thanks very much. fighting extradition requests from two different countries. Sweden dropped its investigation into an alleged rape a few years ago. And today, the Australian activist was told that Britain would not send him to the US either. He's wanted there over the publication of thousands of classified documents ten years ago. Mr Assange's supporters outside court celebrated the decision not to extradite him. I heard more about the ruling from our diplomatic correspondent, James Landale. It was fascinating. Listening to the judge, she made it very clear as she went through a lot of the defence case that had been made by Julian Assange's team that she didn't, dis she didn't agree with a lot of the defence case. You know, what, what the defence had argued that the charges against Mr Assange were political. Well, the judge ruled that she found no evidence to suggest that Donald Trump's administration was any more hostile than, than any other. And she went through all uh, these points... Um, uh, you know, there's no in evidence to suggest that the American Department of Justice intended to punish Mr. Assange as harshly as possible. But then she came to the question of Mr. Assange's mental health. And essentially, she ruled that on the, uh, the basis of the state of his mental health and the fact that he was a suicide risk and that she couldn't be sure that the procedures outlined by the US authorities, that they could not prevent Mr. Assange finding a way to commit suicide, on that point, she ruled against his extradition. And remind us how we got here. He spent seven years holed up in the Ecuadorian embassy and he's been in jail for 21 months. 
Yeah, let's go back 10 years ago. He was the founder of WikiLeaks. He published loads and loads of documents. His campaign, and he said, look, this is evidence of war crimes by the Americans and others in Iraq and Afghanistan. The Americans and others said, hang on a minute. No, you're risking lives by publishing this information. You, you shouldn't do it. There were also then subsequently allegations of sexual offences against Mr. Assange in Sweden that were subsequently dropped. But as a result of all of this, he decided to hide himself in the Ecuadorian embassy for seven years. Eventually, the Ecuadorians handed him in over. He was then um, arrested by the British and detained in Belmarsh, pending this extradition request by the Americans. Uh, and so now we're at the point where the court has ruled that the extradition should not go ahead, but the Americans, of course, have said that they will appeal, uh, and that the question is, you know, what does the higher court think about this initial judgment? But could he be freed today? Well, it is theoretically possible. That is being discussed at the moment. Um, I think that, look, uh, these things don't happen instantaneously. I think that um, a court would have to decide what would be the standard of bail for a man who's just willing to spend seven years in, 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 a, in an embassy voluntarily. I think um, there would be uh, questions about how soon these things can be pursued. So I think any immediate move, I think, would be probably unlikely. But that, the question about bail is still being decided. Our diplomatic correspondent, James Landau. We'll go live to Atlanta, Georgia in a moment for reaction to that extraordinary Donald Trump phone call. But first, the manager of Manchester City Football Club, Pep Guardiola, has defended one of his players after he broke coronavirus restrictions. The French defender, Benjamin Mendy, hosted a party in defiance of British government rules. The Newsroom's Richard Hamilton reports. Benjamin Mendy has said he's sorry for breaking the rules after the Sun newspaper showed pictures of him hosting a New Year's Eve party. Others have suggested he was sorry that he'd been caught. But it comes amid fears that a rise in coronavirus cases in the Premier League could jeopardise the season after the intense efforts to get live football restarted. Manchester City said it would conduct an internal investigation. But the manager, Pep Guardiola, said people should not judge the player too harshly. Don't ask to the players make an example because you put a lot of responsibility in the shoulders to the other one. If, you, if everyone for ourselves take our own responsibility without judge the others, of course you're going to do it. I don't understand why the journalists are there in the home, you know, spying him. But Benjamin is an incredible nice person. However, the Crystal Palace manager, Roy Hodgson, appeared to take a much tougher stance after one of his players was caught breaching protocols. Hodgson warned that the team's captain, Luka Milivojevic, would be punished for attending a New Year's Eve party alongside Fulham's Aleksandra Mitrovic. The Serbian internationals were caught celebrating indoors with at least seven other people. We're disappointed as a football club. We don't expect that to happen. We don't expect our players to, to break any rules. Uh, Luke has apologised, but that's not really enough. He needs to take responsibility. He should know that these are, are matters which are going to you know, cast the club in a, in a bad light. We can only apologise. There is no excuse. Uh, we are unhappy about it, and we will deal with the matter internally. Pictures have also emerged of players from Tottenham and West Ham attending a large house party over Christmas. Politicians have called on the Premier League to ban football as if they breach the rules. The Conservative MP Andrew Bridgen was among those who said footballers are supposed to be role models. But Pep Guardiola said he didn't think they should be held to higher standards than other people in society. Mendy, he said, had made a big mistake, but the matter finishes here. Richard Hamilton. The top Republican election official in the US state of Georgia has become an unlikely hero among Democrats after it was revealed he stood up to pressure from President Trump to overturn Joe Biden's victory. Georgia Secretary of State Brad, Brad Raffensperger spent an hour rejecting Mr Trump's unfounded complaints, even as the president asked him to find 11,780 votes to change the result. So, so tell me, Brad, what are we going to do? We won the election and it's not fair to take it away from us like this. And it's going to be very costly in many ways, and I think you have to say that you're going to re-examine it, and you can re-examine it, but, but re-examine it with people that want to find answers, not people that don't want to find answers. Well, on the line now from Georgia, where there's an important Senate election tomorrow, is our correspondent, Nomia Iqbal. Nomia, tell us about the reaction to this extraordinary call, condemned, of course, by Democrats, but even a few Republicans. 
That's right. Uh, the vice president-elect, Kamala Harris, didn't mince her words. Uh, she said it was a bold abuse of power. She's been in Georgia over the weekend campaigning for the two uh, Democratic candidates who are trying to win seats in the Senate. Uh, Joe Biden's team was quick off the mark. His spokesman released a statement saying that this was irrefut irrefutable proof of a president pressuring and threatening an official in his own party. Uh, going further to say it captures the whole disgraceful story about Donald Trump's assault on American democracy. Uh, Joe Biden is also here later for the Senate race. And as you say, yes, it's not just Democrats criticizing Donald Trump. A former top Republican has come out to have his say. Paul Ryan used to be Speaker of the House. And he said this attempt to overturn the election results uh, was anti-democratic and anti-conservative. Now, interestingly, in the call, President Trump hinted that more would come out on Monday night, referring to his visit to Georgia ahead of that crucial runoff election of those two Senate seats. Could this affect that election? It's interesting because... Uh when I speak to Republicans here, they don't want to talk about it. So I was asked an event over the weekend and I made the point of saying, how does it make your life harder that Mr. Trump keeps calling uh, the election invalid? And it's not just the general election. He says that the Senate race is illegal and invalid. But they say we don't want to go there. Um, but they are worried because the logic goes, if Republican voters don't think that their votes will be accurately counted, then why would they bother turning out and voting? And of course, that gives an advantage to the Democratic Party, because uh, if more people turn out for them and their candidates win, uh, that they get those seats and uh, Joe Biden's presidency is off to a powerful start. Now, there's some suggestion that President Trump may have broken the law with this pressure. Could he face legal action? Well, there is one Democrat on uh, Georgia State's election board who has called for the, the phone call to be investigated for any possible civil and criminal violations. But legal experts here have said that realistically, nothing is likely to happen because remember, it's about a fortnight to go before Donald Trump leaves office. Nomia, many thanks indeed. Nomia Iqbal there, live from Atlanta, Georgia. You're listening to the newsroom from the BBC World Service. Still to come, Cristiano Ronaldo becomes the second highest goal scorer of all time. But who holds the record? Find out a bit later. First, our headlines from Danielle. A court in London has ruled that the WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange cannot be extradited to the United States to face espionage charges. Leading US Democrats have attacked President Trump after he was recorded trying to persuade a top official in Georgia to overturn his election defeat in the state. And Britain has become the first country in the world to start administering a second approved coronavirus vaccine. Yeah, this is the one developed by Oxford University and AstraZeneca and it's been described as a game changer in the fight against the virus. That's because it's five times cheaper than the Pfizer-BioNTech jab and it doesn't need to be kept in the deep freeze so it can be much more easily used in the developing world. Globally, AstraZeneca hopes to produce up to three billion doses this year. Earlier, we spoke to our health correspondent, Jim Reid. This could be very significant. The UK has got 100 million doses of this particular vaccine on order, but there's 2.5 billion doses ordered worldwide. Countries like Peru, Japan, 300 million doses on order to the EU at the moment. Last week, we had India also approved this vaccine where it's called COVID Shield. The Serum Institute in India is one of the largest manufacturers of vaccines in the world. They have 50 million doses just of this vaccine ready to go straight away. Why is it so important? Well, you mentioned this in the introduction. First of all, the price. So it's around $3 a dose for this vaccine. The Pfizer vaccine that we've also been talking about, developed by Pfizer and BioNTech, a German company, is about $15 to $20 a dose. So you can see the advantage there. Also, this is far easier to distribute. This technology can be held in fridge or freezer temperature, whereas some of the other vaccines need to be kept, as you say, in the deep freeze. So in countries that don't have that extreme cold infrastructure, this could be very important indeed. Now, here in Britain, as with the uh, Pfizer jab, the, the government's planning to delay the second dose of AstraZeneca. You're supposed to have two doses of it, but they want more people to get there first and so get some protection. Let's just have a listen to the UK Health Secretary, Matt Hancock, talking on the BBC today. After a fortnight, the protection from the Pfizer jab is at 89%. So this is a highly effective 
uh, vaccine. Both the Pfizer and the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccines, both highly effective at protecting you and they are effective after one dose. And that's why we've extended the period until you get your second dose, because we will be able to save more lives and get more people their first dose faster because of this change. Matt Hancock. So, Jim, how does that delay fit in with what the uh, developers say about it? I wish there was a simple answer to this, and I'm afraid there isn't. So originally under the clinical trials, this vaccine was given uh, with a three week interval between doses. And at that point, it was found to be around 70 percent effective. What they're saying in the UK is, look, if you extend that second dose to 12 weeks, there's two advantages. One, you can clearly give it more quickly to more people. Secondly, they say, look, the longer you leave this interval, there is some evidence that shows it becomes more effective. So they're using a figure of up to 80% effective if you leave a longer dose. Obviously, this could be very important as we battle to get this vaccine into as many people as possible. Our health correspondent, Jim Reid. Let's get more now on the news that Iran has seized a South Korean tanker. Iranian media said the vessel had been taken by the Revolutionary Guards for polluting the Gulf with chemicals. The UK Maritime Trade Operations Naval Authority said an interaction between Iranian authorities and a merchant vessel in the Strait of Hormuz led the ship to alter its course and go into Iranian waters. It comes as Iran increases its uranium enrichment in defiance of a deal with world powers. Let's talk to our Middle East analyst, Sebastian Usher. Seb, first of all, what more can you tell us about the tanker? Well, this uh, vessel, which, um, as far as we know, was travelling from Saudi Arabia to United Arab Emirates, it changed its course uh, about 20 hours ago. Um, There was speculation that it had been seized which was confirmed an hour or two ago by the Iranians themselves, as you were saying, the Revolutionary Guards, having taken it, saying the reason is because it was it, it, it had been re- reported for violating uh, environmental laws uh, several times. It's now being docked at the Iranian port of Bandar Abbas. The crew are under arrest. Um, it's not saying uh, any more information about that at the moment, the Iranian sources. I mean, obviously, this will be seen as, as a provocation, uh, tensions are high, not that they haven't been throughout, but particularly over the last few days with the first anniversary of the U.S. assassination of uh, Qasem Soleimani, uh, the, the, the top military commander in Iran. And there were threats from all sides over that. So I think it will be seen in that context with the fact that it's a South Korean flag tanker and that none of the crew are from any of the countries that are most involved in this showdown means that this is probably something that, 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 that will be put on the back burner, I would say. Yeah. Is it a coincidence that it comes at the same time as them upping their enrichment of uranium? Um, well, I mean, again, that will be seen and that, in a sense, is far more um, significant. I mean, that's a big jump. It's gone up uh, the enrichment to 20 percent from around 4 percent, still far short of the 90 percent needed to actually move towards nuclear weapons. But already we've had reactions uh, immediately and unsurprisingly from the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu saying that this is to develop nuclear weapons and Israel will continue to do everything to stop Iran from doing that. But the EU which is still a, a you know a major player in the 2015 nuclear deal has also expressed its concern there's going to be a report from the international nuclear watchdog later today on this so it is a significant development yes and i think you can see it again as the iranians putting pressure Uh, internationally to see what happens, but still within limits. Uh, It will undoubtedly make things more difficult for Joe Biden, who's going to take over as president of the United States. He is offering diplomacy or trying to offer diplomacy with Iran instead of the absolute uh, confrontation that we've seen under President Trump. Uh, This won't make things any easier for him, either of these two instances. Sebastian Arsha, thank you. Now let's get a quick look at some of the day's other news with Danielle. The head of Kenya's National Union of Teachers says he's worried about the safety of students and teachers as schools in the country reopen today. In an interview with the BBC, Wilson Saucion described the level of preparation as quite inadequate. Mr Saucion said day schools, which number more than boarding schools, are disadvantaged, as many do not have running water for hand washing. He said the government had not released funds to schools to buy thermometers, sanitizers, and other items. 
The Japanese Prime Minister Yoshihide Suga says he's considering declaring a state of emergency in the Tokyo region to combat a very severe third wave of coronavirus infections. It's likely to last a month from next Saturday. The Japanese capital saw a record 884 new cases on Monday, more than 100 of them serious. The emergency won't include school closures or be as strict as the last one last spring, but Mr Suga urged people to go out as little as possible. He said he hoped Japan would begin vaccinations in late February and he would receive one as an example. And a Russian villager could face seven years in jail for collecting fallen timber in a forest in a test case with significance for the rural population. Gennady Tolchonkov of the Nizhny Novgorod region in western Russia noticed that a storm had knocked down some trees. He cut up 13 trunks with a chainsaw and dragged them home. Mr Tolchonkov thought he was acting within his rights after a law was introduced in 2019 allowing the collection of fallen wood. But he was shocked to find he'd been charged with large-scale illegal tree felling, which carries a jail sentence or a fine of up to $40,000. Coronavirus travel restrictions have devastated global tourism. One country that's seen its once thriving industry struggle is the United Arab Emirates. But after suffering fewer than 700 Covid deaths, there is hope of a much sunnier 2021, as Georgia Tolley reports from Dubai. That's the sound of us going up a really tall hill. I have a horrible feeling we can only now go down. What? 2020 has been something of a roller coaster for the tourism industry in the United Arab Emirates. The sector accounts for 11.5% of Dubai's GDP, and the Emirate welcomed more than 16.7 million visitors in 2019. They planned for 20 million in 2020, but that all changed in March when the ruling sheikhs closed the borders and brought in a strict three week total lockdown. <laughs> All tourism activities stopped. The malls were mothballed, theme parks closed, and the global event Expo 2020 was postponed. Some big hotel chains laid off more than 30% of their staff. Small businesses, many owned by expats, struggled to stay afloat. They've just released the safety road, and we are now gradually, gently rising up into the air. Adam McEwen is the CEO of Hero Experiences Dubai, a travel company that offers safaris, boat trips and hot air balloon adventures. I met him in a busy hotel cafe overlooking the warm waters of the Arabian Gulf. 2020 has been an interesting challenge, but losing money is not fun. And worst of all, we've lost about 40% of our staff. And when you lose that many staff, there's people that you really, really don't want to let go of. You know, you have a choice between two people. Do you let go of the single mother? Do you let go of the guy who just had a baby? It becomes very, very personal. We're small enough that you still actually really care. Open. That's a word that hasn't been used much in the world these days, huh? Well, open is looking good for Dubai right now. And we want to tell the world about it. After nearly four months, Dubai reopened to tourists on the 7th of July. At first, no one came. The desert in summer is too hot, and most other countries were still closed. But the tourism sector had an unexpected boost from staycations, which, according to the government, surged 107% during 2020. Hotel occupancy figures in the UAE rose by more than half in October, the highest rate since coronavirus first hit the region. However, they were still down by 31% compared to the same month last year. And room rates are also down by a third. Georgia Tolley in Dubai. The Italian football champions Juventus have had a relatively poor season currently in fifth. But that hasn't stopped their star player Cristiano Ronaldo hitting new highs. Yesterday he became the second highest goalscorer of all time overtaking Pele and now only behind Joseph Bitsan. I asked our sports news correspondent Alex Capstick how Ronaldo had done it. Yeah, remarkable, isn't it? Those two goals against Udine. Easy moving him above Pele, as you say, uh, in the all-time list. Incredible tally for Cristiano Ronaldo. 
all began in 2002 when he was at Sporting Lisbon, kept on scoring at Manchester United. Most of his goals, though, have come at Real Madrid, 450 in 438 appearances there. He's also done it at international level, 102 for Portugal in just 120 matches, and that total is likely to be improved upon in the coming months. Uh, Portugal set to defend their Euros title later this year, and he's done all of this at the top level, 134 goals in the Champions League. That is a record. He's 35 years old, perhaps not too many years left before retirement, but certainly enough time for him to rack up a huge total. Next on the list below Pelle, someone who you might consider would be close, Lionel Messi, 740 goals. The vast majority, of course, for Barcelona, but he has played 200 fewer games. And Ronaldo, not even a, a pure out-and-out striker, unlike the man who tops the list. Tell us more about Joseph Bican. Yes, this is a fantastic pub question, isn't it? Who is the greatest goal scorer of all time? And probably not many would pick out Joseph Bitsen, often referred to as football's forgotten legend. And his record, you know, it stood for more than 70 years, known for his speed, clinical finishing. It's estimated he scored a total of 805 goals in 530 official matches, many of them at Rapid Vienna, who he joined in 1931, still a teenager, and for an exceptional Austrian national team that did well at the 1934 World Cup, reached the semi-finals there. Alex Capstick. We'll have a summary next. That's it for now from the newsroom. Next, the conversation looks at how to be happy. And then in 30 minutes, it's News Hour with Razia Iqbal. On the programme today, Democrats in the US accuse President Trump of abusing his powers after a tape indicates him trying to persuade an official in the state of Georgia to overturn his election defeat. And Britain begins inoculating people with the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine in what the government hopes will be a turning point in the fight against the pandemic. Then the guest on Hard Talk is the chief exploration scientist at NASA, Jacob Leacher. Being in a um, position where we can survive on the surface of the moon for longer periods of time, uh, begin to place infrastructure there, uh, a critical aspect to that is can you use any of the resources there? And online, you can hear our series looking at saving our planet. They've seen bulldozers come in to take away the land and they're completely helpless against it. Hear more at bbcworldservice.com slash climate question. Given the state of the world right now, happiness might seem to be something out of reach. But while our circumstances might be difficult, we can try to reframe how we experience them. On The Conversation, tips and advice from South Korea and Denmark. You'll hear about the Korean concept of nunchi and why the ability to read a room can lead to harmony and happiness. And why Denmark constantly tops the happiest country surveys. What are they getting right? That's all after the news with me, Kim Chakaneza. BBC News with Danielle Jawowiecka. A court in London has ruled that the WikiLeaks founder, Julian Assange, cannot be extradited to the United States to face charges relating to the disclosure of hundreds of thousands of secret military and diplomatic documents. The judge said there was a real risk he'd commit suicide. The US claims the leaks, the biggest in its history, broke the law and endangered lives. Britain has begun inoculating people with the Oxford AstraZeneca coronavirus vaccine in what the government hopes will be a turning point in the fight against the pandemic. The authorities plan to administer more than half a million doses at hundreds of vaccination centres. The UK is facing a surge in coronavirus cases linked to a more infectious variant of the virus. France is starting to vaccinate healthcare workers over 50 amid anger at the slow progress of its national coronavirus vaccination campaign. In the first days of the campaign, the number of those vaccinated had only reached several hundred. President Emmanuel Macron is reportedly furious. An investigation has been launched in Poland after 18 celebrities and politicians jumped the queue to receive coronavirus vaccinations. Currently, only medical workers and their families are eligible to be vaccinated. The group, which included well-known actors and a former prime minister, are reported to have agreed to serve as ambassadors as part of a vaccination drive. An Iranian government spokesman has said that Iran has resumed 20% uranium enrichment at its Fordo nuclear facility in its latest breach of the 2015 nuclear deal. The spokesman said that the enrichment had just restarted at the underground nuclear complex. Iranian media say that the Revolutionary Guards have seized a South Korean flagged vessel in the Gulf. 
The vessel had earlier been reported to have changed course without explanation from its route between Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. BBC News. This is The Conversation. I'm Kim Chakaneta, and this is the programme about how women are shaping the world. Welcome. Each week I'm joined by two guests from different countries with a shared passion, profession or experience. Today on the programme, how to be happy. Now to broach the topic of happiness as a global pandemic rages may seem counterintuitive. But while there are many events and decisions out of our control right now, they are smaller things we can do to change how we experience the world and help us feel less stressed and anxious and ideally happier. My guests today are two women with unique perspectives on the topic of happiness. Yuni Hong is a Korean-American journalist and the author of The Power of Nunchi, The Korean Secret to Happiness and Success. And if you're wondering what Nunchi is, it's a type of superpower we can all harness with a bit of work. I'll get Yuni to explain it in a moment. Melina Rydell is from Denmark, a country that often tops those annual happiest countries in the world lists, a topic she explores in her book, Happy as a Dane. 10 Secrets of the Happiest People in the World. Melina is also a speaker and executive coach specializing in happiness, well-being and management. Welcome to you both, Uni and Melina. Thank you very much. Uni, what is happiness to you? Oh, gosh. Go right for the hard question. <laughs> right there. <laughs> happiness is, as the French say, c'est pas évident. It is extremely elusive. I think that the best way to approach it is pragmatically and through actions with a framework of remembering that we're animals first and cerebral being second. And I think that's where people find happiness so difficult is that they, they're approaching it too cerebrally and not animalistically. Melina, how would you define happiness? Well, I mean, I'm, of course, a little bit uh, influenced by where I come from, but I would say my if I start with my own personal definition of happiness, I would say it's alignment. It's being aligned between who I am inside, what I think, what I say, and what I do in the end. Um, For me, it's probably a state more peace of mind, but it's also what I call my base of well-being. It's when I'm aligned, when I'm true to who I am. No matter what kind of cards I'm played from life, Mm -hmm. uh, no matter what happens, And then, of course, if you go back to the Danish model, I would say something different when you create collective well-being in a society. Right. Okay. so we'll definitely come to that because I want to talk more about that Danish model. But okay. But can I just come back to you, Uni, then? Um, When did you last look around you and think, I'm feeling happy? (laughs) Actually, when I woke up this morning, (laughs) Ah. I would say, you know, just I mean, because the weather here is completely rubbish, but um, I'm sure Malina will agree that so much of happiness arises from biology and just today waking up and knowing that I had a good night's sleep and of having a coffee and I was looking forward to talking to both of you. Just three things that I mentioned and I think if you have more than three things in your head, that's when happiness can start to be erode. <laughs> so... Okay. Well, let's talk about the research you've done. Now, Melina, why does Denmark constantly top the happiest country surveys? What are the Danes doing right? The World Happiness Report came out for the first time in 2012. And um, the three main reasons that made Denmark one of the happiest countries in the world would be, first of all, trust. Denmark has the highest level of trust in the world. So eight out of 10 Danes trust the other person that they don't know. So um, the stranger in the street, they they tend to trust that person. So the quality of the relations are um, sort of more positive and and, and better. Uh, The trust in government and institutions is even higher. It's at 84%. So generally speaking, people believe in the society they live in and the way they relate to it. So this is about collective well-being. It's about individual well-being, but it's also about how do we make the biggest part of the group feel good? Mm -hmm. And um, the second ingredient is uh, what I call the freedom to be you. It's more about our educational system in Denmark, where the main purpose purpose is simply to develop the personality of the child and the self-confidence in the child. So in Danish schools, we teach all of the things that you might end up doing. So we teach cooking classes, uh, mechanics and, and, and woodworks and, and sewing and, and, and of course, uh, intellectual matters, math and languages, but no 
talents are valued more than other talents. So it's not because you're good at math or languages that you're better than somebody who's good in creativity and and, in cooking. And so we end up in a society where people, when they're children, are taught that they're good enough and what they're good at is needed and appreciated and valued in society. At the age of six years old, we start teaching the children empathy. So we have what we call the hour of the class, which is all about allowing people to express their emotions and also teaching them to understand those of others. So I call that the permission to be human because in many societies, we see that people are basically told not to show the world who they are because Mm -hmm. that might be embarrassing. It might actually be shameful to actually show who you are. So we build up these barriers. And the last piece is feeling that you belong to a common project with purpose. So this would be the Danish welfare state. So in Denmark, you see that seven out of 10 Danes actually like paying taxes. They feel that they're individually involved and responsible in this common project of the welfare state. And they feel a sense of purpose contributing to that. So that would be the three main reasons. And this is how you built actually well-being in corporations today as well. When you have a sense of purpose, when you have trust, and when you have a certain level of empathy and freedom to actually ask a question, admit an error or submit an idea. But Melina, there'll be those listening who will say, of course, Denmark is at the top of these indexes. It's a wealthy country, has a functional social welfare, generous and progressive policies. And it's easier to be happier if you aren't struggling, you know, if there's no conflict. Well, um, rich countries are, generally speaking, a bit happier than poor countries. But if you slice it up a bit differently, you don't have Qatar or Saudi Arabia on the top, you know. So it's not only about being a rich country, right. but it has, it, it does have influence. It's also about life expectancy and good health. So not about living for a long time, but what is the condition you live in sure. in the time you live? It's about social support. Do you have somebody you can count on in your environment? It's about the freedom to choose your life. It's about generosity. Have you helped or given money to somebody in the last month? It's about, again, how good are we at building social relations? And then it's about how you perceive other people. We go back to trust. It's about do you perceive other people to be corrupt? And Yuni, I want to come to you this Korean concept of nunchi, and I half jokingly described it as a superpower. Firstly, how do you translate the term? What does nunchi mean? Sure. Nunchi literally means I. Nun is I, and chi means measure. So I'm measuring, which is basically reading a room, but it's more intense than that. It's uh, using all of your senses when you enter a room to see what the mood of the room is as a whole before you act. And this is a way of creating harmony and improving the environment of any room that you enter. So uh, Nunchi is sometimes called in Korea the superpower of the underdog, the special secret weapon of the underdog. Denmark is a, a very enlightened society. A lot of people don't have those advantages, or even if they're from a privileged country, there are people who were raised in abusive situations just sort of underprivileged situations. And nunchi is a tool that everyone has that allows them to arise out of that because no matter how unfortunate your circumstances are, you still have your eyes and your ears. And how do you use it? Well, there was a Greek philosopher named Epictetus. He wasn't Korean, but this is a very Korean idea. And he said, we're given two ears and one mouth Mm -hmm. that we may listen twice as much as we speak. And I think that anyone, regardless of background, can use that as a way of, you know, that's your bootstraps if you have nothing else. Uh, And I think that the Nunchi story is very approachable in its practicality and in the fact that you don't need anything in order to do it. And you can still use Nunchi to get ahead. Well, let's move on and talk about gender and happiness. Melina, do you think gender affects how we experience happiness? I think... If I look back at at what I just said in terms of the Danish model, Mm -hmm. trust, empathy, purpose maybe a little bit less, but we refer to them as feminine values. Mm -hmm. We refer to Denmark as a feminine country based on feminine values. But that would be stereotyping a little bit too much, I think. I don't think so particularly, but I think sometimes I see studies that show that women are a little bit happier, but then I also see studies that show that 
women when they get married they're a little bit less happy than men that get married and, you know there are all these <laughs> these studies that say one thing and then you can get another study to say something else but but i would say some of the values that i talk about as ingredients maybe women are naturally better at them sure. creating empathy relations and trust yeah, yeah i agree in in denmark we we also encourage men to actually be allowed to like their family and, and say i want to pick up the children as well and i want to spend time with my family so by working on freeing up men as much as freeing up women we kind of became one of the most egalitarian countries in the world in terms of gender equality as well because men also say i'm picking up the children and and so those are some of the major issues in the workplaces that women are seen as, as as weak and emotional when they prioritize family or private stuff i think that's interesting that we need to encourage men to also show emotions to a certain degree I agree. As we know, the male suicide rate for adults is much, much higher than the female suicide rate. So that's evidence that, you know, having more money or having more power obviously does not lead to happiness. And Nunchi is a way of saying it doesn't really matter right now how you feel about yourself. You can always plug into your environment. And in fact, you know, if you know people with anxiety, one treatment is, you know, there's a list. Name five things that you can see. Name four things that you can hear name three things that you can smell. And that's a way of helping somebody get through a panic attack. And so Nunchi is very much like that. It's sort of like, you can't control how you're feeling and it's okay if you can't really function. But what you can do is use your five senses. Does it lead to immediate happiness? Probably not, but it gives you the tools. Mm -hmm. Okay, I want to talk about some practical things that can be done to improve our lives. Um, in both your books, you mentioned some surprising things. One of them is good manners. Uni, how does being polite and well-mannered tie into happiness? What's the link there? I think that good manners are um, something that parents teach to children at a young age it means that they instinctively know that their child will not be liked in society if they upset other people. And good manners doesn't just mean you're not rude. It's not just hoity-toity. You know, the reason that you have to know that your bread plate is on the left is that if you think it's on your right, you're taking somebody else's bread. It, 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 to the child, it just seems like, wow, my parents are really strict and they're uptight about these really old fashioned ideas. But it's just much better if everyone gets along. And it's much easier to get along if everyone takes the correct bread. <laughs> Okay, uh, well, let's take a break. Um, how can we all live happier lives? That's the question I'm asking my guests today on The Conversation. They are Yu Ni Hong, a Korean-American journalist and author who has written about a concept called nunchi, which is all about reading a room or someone's feelings, and how mastering that makes for a happier environment. And Melina Rydell is from Denmark, a country considered to be one of the happiest in the world, and she's written about aspects of Danish culture that could apply elsewhere and boost our overall chances of happiness. Melina, should we be pursuing happiness? Because happiness is something ephemeral. Should we rather not be seeking contentment, which to me seems to be a more longer lasting proposition? Well, I think we should be seeking alignment and, and I think we should practice gratitude. And I think we should be more conscious about how we relate to things that happen to us and how much we compare ourselves to others. Um, I do think that what we need to focus on is the quality of our relationships, because we know from the longest study that has ever been made by Harvard University, from 75 years of studying 728 men, we know that one of the main elements that influence our happiness is the quality of our relationships. So if you seek happiness and you mistake it for pleasure, you will be running around like a little hamster in your wheel because <laughs> it's never enough. And because you will be very quickly the victim of the hedonic treadmill. And the hedonic treadmill is, you know, you want something. You think if you're more beautiful, if you get more power, if you get more money and, and fame, and, and, and then you finally be happy. And then you get it and you get like a small satisfaction, few hours, few days, few weeks. The maximum would be a few few months. And then you, you, you go there again, you adapt to it, and then you want more so it's never enough and so a lot of people seek from the outside some sort of approval or satisfaction that they won't ever really get if you go for seeking purpose in life why what is it I contribute to why do I get up in the morning how do I feel that I 
do something valuable, meaningful in life. And, and then generally speaking, getting along with yourself and other people. You know, it's very simple. It's not very simple to do, maybe, but it, it, <laughs> when you look at what matters, it's really mm. simple. Yuni, Melina mentioned the quality of relationships and how important that is. Could you talk a little bit about Nunchi in the context of a relationship um, between a couple, for example? Like, how, how would that play out or work out? First of all, I agree with everything that Marlena said. Um, yeah, and I would add adaptability. And I think that if you look at a romantic relationship in a couple, for example, the couples usually have a cyclical argument. There's, you know, there are two or three topics that they always revisit like a broken record. And it's sort of like you're stuck in a glitch in the matrix. You keep having it in a loop and you know what they're going to say and they know what you're going to say. You do it anyway. It's because one or both parties is, is hesitant to say what they really feel. And it's not really their fault. And I'm gonna say something that is the exact opposite of what most Western couple therapists would say. Most couple therapists would say to the person who's not expressing their feelings, they would say, it's your responsibility to tell your partner what you're feeling. It's not their responsibility to be a mind reader. And I would say the exact opposite is true. It is your responsibility to be a mind reader. Really? If you want to be happy, you have to be a mind reader. Um, and in order to, the, to do that, as I said earlier, you have to listen twice as much as you speak. So a lot of people, especially women, do not talk about their feelings. They were discouraged from it because it was you know, weak. And men are really discouraged from it. And it's not their fault. They cannot undo their whole upbringing just because they're dating you. So you can't expect them to speak up. You have to really read them. And people think that that is so unfair. They are insistent, no, you have to express yourself. You have to use your words. You're not a child. That's not a very peaceful solution. Wow, that's a refreshingly different take. Um, now, Melina, a lot of your work is with corporations. How are the principles of happiness applied in business? Well, I tend to take maybe more of a rational um, take on it. So we've seen a lot of almost a, a fashion or a tendency at least to employ a chief happiness officers <laughs> that um, make it more enjoyable to work. So they would organize cocktails and, and, and birthday parties and they would um, have fruit baskets and, and foot massages and, <laughs> and uh, the ping pong and, and stuff like that. The problem with that is that when you try to fix it, through pleasure. People get used to it and they take it for granted. So I tell people to actually just focus on the company culture. I order executive committees to, or I recommend, I don't order them to do anything, but I, <laughs> I recommend them to uh, work on their level of self-awareness. And, and this is what Uni essentially is saying. It's like, you need to be a mind reader. And if you want to be a mind reader, you need to know yourself and your filters because we color the world according to what we believe and according to our values. And if you don't know what they are, you don't know what your starting point is. I know what my starting point is. And I know why some people spark um, insecurity when I meet them or feel irritated or I know where it comes from. So I can filter that back to myself. And it's not so much about the other person, it's about me. So this groundwork of having a high level of self-awareness gives you the capacity to better read yourself, but also, again, use empathy to build relations in the organization. What I'm trying to build is what I call psychological safety. This is a, a professor at Howard University called Amy Edmondson who researched on this. People should feel that they can be free to be themselves and ask a question submit an idea, admit an error, say, I don't quite understand the question, or I'm not sure I have the competences, without being scared of being judged or humiliated by the group. And so when you have this, it creates well-being, it creates performance, it creates innovation. So this is where it really, really can matter. Uni, you believe successful business people have a quick nunchi. Why is that important? Well, I think it's sometimes easier to describe nunchi to people in terms of people who don't have it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll give an example of, I worked for a company once where the CEO was 
famous for while walking in the room, he would be making some joke because, you know, he felt like I'm the CEO. This is what people expect. And he would never really know what was going on. And it's not a coincidence. He was asked to leave because he did not know how unhappy his employees were. And he didn't know how unhappy they were because he didn't listen. Well, having established that happiness isn't something that just happens to you, that everyone has the power to make small changes in our behaviour to get closer to it. Melina, what are one or two adjustments we can make in our own daily behaviours? I think one of the most easy things that people can do is gratitude. It's actually, um, it's sitting down, even when you're in a difficult period, of actually putting down three things that you're grateful for at the end of the day. And this will help you over time have a much more positive outlook on the world and what you live. And it's, again, how you relate to other people, how good are you at reading them, you know. And, and also look at, this is what they do in the World Happiness Report. They look at how good you are or how many negative and positive emotions you have during a day. How frustrated are you with the other person? Because most of our frustrations come from thinking that the other person is wrong in some way. The way they drive, the way they stand in line, the way they walk in the street, or if you're in a meeting, the way they talk. Or, or So a lot of this frustration is about thinking other people are wrong and, and you're right, maybe. And so I think this thing about getting to know yourself well and, and be aware of where you're a little bit extreme in judging other people. And um, maybe trying to adjust those filters a little bit so that you have a more tolerant view on the world and that you're better at seeing people, understanding them and accepting them, which is a really good base to have a, a life filled with good relations and well-being and, and happiness. Happiness is not on command. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're able to actually enjoy that coffee in the morning, as much as you enjoyed it the first time you got it or look at the place you live or the people that you have in your life and say like, I'm so grateful that I have all this. Gratitude was what got me out of the grief when I lost my father a couple of years ago. I really every day did it for a long period and, and, it, and it helped. It helped and it helps in a period like the COVID-19 because there are things that we can be grateful for every day, every day, every day, every day. And, and you know, if you go down to the, Basic, 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 it's being alive. I think Uni said it in the beginning of the program. Even if things are really like tough, mm -hmm. that's that's one to start with. And if you're not, then it's 